Good morning. Today is September 20th, 2021. My name is Frank Farmer. So today we have Mr. Neil Coates. Mr. Coates uh, is a lifetime uh, a resident of New Smyrna Beach, Florida, grew up here, went to the local schools, and then enlisted in the Marine Corps and completed two tours of duty during the Vietnam War. So Mr. Coates, in advance, let me thank you for your service to this country and thank you for coming down here today and being part of the program. Thank you, Mr. Farmer. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here today to uh, relive those um, days of Vietnam, and I, I really appreciate the invitation. Thank you very much. Well, great. Well, now, you entered the Marine Corps essentially right out of high school, I think. So tell us what were your motives for going into the military service? When did you go into the military service? And why specifically did you go into the uh, United States Marine Corps? Well, Frank, uh, many reasons. Uh, during the time of 68, when I graduated, 67 when I graduated from high school, uh, my family from New Smyrna were very poor. I was unable to, um, they were unable to send me to college. So I had an option, military or full-time job. So I always liked the uh, motto of the Marines, simplify, always faithful. So I had an opportunity to join the Marine Corps and uh, it was an honor. I was the first generation uh, Marine in my family. So no one else in your family has served in the, in the Marine Corps until you, is that correct? I was the only one, everyone, my father and my brother was uh, in the Army. And my brother served in Vietnam, and I served in Vietnam as well. Now you entered, you said, the Marine Corps in 1967. So tell us, where did you go for your uh, boot camp? We, we've all heard stories about Marine Corps boot camp and uh, dr the uh, DIs or the drill instructors. So tell us about where you went for your boot camp and what was that experience like? Uh, boot camp was Paris Island, South Carolina. Uh, I guess you can call it the home of the sand fleas. Uh, uh, we sp I spent eight weeks in Paris Island, and then I graduate from there to Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Uh, uh, Paris Island was uh, it was a challenge, but it was to prepare us for the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, my drill instructors, uh, there was three of them. And my senior drill instructor and our, uh, I re remember this very clearly, Batoon 1015. It was the old barracks in Vietnam, in um, Paris Island, South Carolina. So uh, you, you were there for eight weeks. Yes. And did you feel that, uh, and I'm sure you did, that the Marine Corps uh, had, uh, had given you uh, a solid basis for uh, training during those eight weeks? Yes, I feel it was ample enough time. Uh, the uh, our drill instructors prepared us for the Vietnam War, and they explained very clearly that 50% of us would probably make it back, 50% of us would probably die if we didn't listen to the instructions from our drill instructors and the ones that was in charge. Now, when you went into the Marine Corps, did you go into uh, the Marine Corps with any buddies from this area, or, or were you up there by yourself being introduced to others? I was the only one. Uh, we signed, I signed up what they call a 120-day delay program, uh, but my other friend backed out, and he joined the Army, and I continued to go in, and we took our test and took our oath in Jacksonville, and I went in by myself. Uh, and then I met friends from all over the area uh, once I got in boot camp. So tell us about some of your uh, fellow recruits. So where were they from? Or was it uh, they have the same attitude about, uh, about things that you did? Or was this, a, was this a new experience for you? Well, we all were young. And uh, I met Brandon Bull from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I met another young man, Jonas Nair from Jacksonville, Florida. And they call us the NBC team, Nair, Bull, and Coates. And um, we got to be very good friends. My parents was unable to come up to Carolina for the graduation, but Brandon's parents came up and Jonas Nair's uh, parents came up. And uh, later on, I explained uh, what happened once we arrived in Vietnam with my two buddies. So are, are your two friends uh, still here today? Well, Jonas Nair uh, was involved up in Chulai, I mean, Fubai, and he was involved in an accident, and uh, 
he's uh, having some medical issues. Brandon returned, and he had medical issues, and he passed two years ago. Okay. But we were the NBC team, the Nair okay. Bull and Coats. Okay. And uh, were they African Americans? Uh, as you uh, said, Jonas was Afro American, and um, Brandon was my blue eyed brother. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so after a boot camp, uh, did you receive a specialty at that time? An MOS, a military obligation? Yeah, my mili military obligation specialist was a 1371, a combat engineer. And uh, my uh, profession at that time, we would. Uh, clear LZs, uh, the landing zones. We were in medevac, um, the wounded. Uh, we would bring in uh, helicopter supplies. Uh, the chopper, the 53 was the Jolly Green Giant, and the 46 was the banana would bring in uh, supplies for the troops while we were out in the field. And we would bring the coordinates so they can land if it was a, co a coal LZ. A hot LZ landing zone mean that the enemy was in the area they were shooting and they could not land without supplies. Now, when you went through basic boot camp, you, of course, did not have that specialized training. You were doing the basic training to become a, uh, uh, a Marine. So after boot camp, where did you go for your specialty training as a combat engineer? and How long was that? We went to Geiger, and then I went to Camp Lejeune, as I mentioned earlier. Camp Lejeune was an advanced training, and then at that point, I left to go to uh, San Diego, Camp Pendleton, California, and then we had advanced training there, and then I was, uh, met, uh, my uh, orders was to go to Vietnam uh, from that point. How, how long had you been in the Marine Corps when you received orders to go to Vietnam? Uh, it was about nine weeks, and then, only but, nine weeks from yeah. after entering uh, right. the Marine Corps, you received orders to right. go to Vietnam. And, and I knew I was going to Vietnam because of my MOS and the critical part of the war. Remember that was '68, and um, and it's interesting. In '68, President Johnson was our president, and um, Charles Robb was his son-in-law, and we uh, and I met. He was one of my battalion commanders in Vietnam, Charles Robb. So when you went to Vietnam, where did they send you? What part of Vietnam were you sent to and what unit did you join? I was in uh, Da Nang, Freedom Hill. Uh, Freedom Hill, uh, coming in as a 20-year-old uh, uh, young Marine from uh, Camp Pendleton. Uh, I, uh, we were hit that night. We came in by Continental Airlines. The I first night you were there? Yes, the first night. Uh, across Freedom Hill, there's an ammunition ammo dump, and it was hit. Before I was issued a weapon, uh, we had to get into bunkers, and I was scared to death. A young fella from uh, the States had never been introduced to a war, just the combat training that I received uh, in boot camp. Uh, I was scared to death, So, but I, we survived uh -huh. that night. And uh, the next day, I was issued all of my um, uh, uh, material uh, weapons for the uh, combat. So you were you were uh, hit before you were issued your weapons yes. and your gear for combat. Yes, we were all mustered together to receive our weapons and uh, your flight jacket, your helmet, all of the gear that we would use for combat. And that night, we heard the motors and the rockets coming in and the ammo dump is crossed from Freedom Hill. And uh, it was it was quite experience, and I was scared to death again. A young Marine coming in, uh, you know, the motto is simplify, always faithful, and I was faithful as I entered the bunker <laughs> with the rest of us. <laughs> How old were you at, uh, at that, when you went was, to Vietnam? I was 20, I turned 21 in Vietnam. Now, as you, as you entered Vietnam and as you prepared to get in combat, uh, and combat uh, it came along a little earlier than you suspected, as you've told us here. What did your officers and your uh, non-commissioned officers tell you about the uh, the enemy, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese? What was their assessment? What was their advice to you? It was, uh, you know, we had to, of course, wear our hard hats, or we had to put all our military gear together. The most important thing was that you had a point man, someone up front, and then you had a medic, a corpsman, we called them doctors, 
with our unit and the, 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 the part about our training, we was cross-trained. If someone get hurt, someone get wounded, you take that position. So I was trained to, uh, if someone had gotten hurt, which they did, uh, wounded, uh, we would take that position. If it was a machine gun operator, you are trained to use that as well. And, of course, the, uh, the corpsmen for the Marine Corps were Navy Corps. Yes. That wore Marine Corps uniforms. And, that, is, that is correct. And I think were considered Marines by the Marines that they served, even though they were Navy. Is that, that correct? Well, they still Navy, but they're our best uh, support to help us out. We call them doctors. But the unique thing about a corpsman, when someone was hit, it was corpsman up. And you asked me earlier, Frank, in reference to what we were told by our officers, we would wear exignias, ex ex uh, meaning your rank. That was one of the most crucial uh, components that you would remove in combat. Uh, and at night, you were not allowed to smoke in combat because the enemy could see the cigarette, they could tell what rank that you had. Even the officers could not wear their insignias really? as well. Now, what was the uh, what was the opinion of most of the uh, of the officers that passed on to you of the ability of the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong as a uh, fighting force? What the did they do? the North uh, Vietnamese uh, versus the v VC, as we would call it, Viet Cong. Uh, the North Vietnamese are well trained uh, military um, um, soldiers. The Viet Cong, they all would wear basically the little black pajamas or a little hat. Uh, they were not as well trained. But the point is, you couldn't trust either one. Now, most of your North Viet uh, Manese were a real large, tall people. And one of the operations that I was on, we had captured one of the uh, North Viet Manese and uh, they tied the hand behind the back and, of course, put something over their eyes so they don't recognize anyone or any location. Uh, but they are very tall. They would carry their <clears throat> weapons. The AK-47 was a popular weapon in Vietnam. Uh, but the, the, VC, the VC of Viet Cong, they wasn't as trained well as the North Vietnamese. Well, what you're describing is that the uh, North Vietnamese were a, a pretty formidable enemy, and the Viet Cong, even though they were not as well trained, were still a, a pretty effective fighting force. Is yes, they were pretty well organized, and they was effective. But being in the military and being a, a Marine, I'm, I'm really uh, very proud of being a Marine. And the, the bottom line to me is uh, the Semper Fi, Semper Fi is always faithful. And uh, I was just dedicated to the Marine Corps. And today, I'm still, once a Marine, always a Marine. Well, that's great. That's great that uh, I can see your pride in, uh, in being a Marine. Uh, and and that's, tr that's tremendous, uh, Mr. Coates. Uh, now, you said you were a combat engineer, and you kind of described some of your missions. What were your main missions in Vietnam? Tell us some of the, the uh, missions that a <clears throat> combat engineer in the, the Marine Corps. The main was. mission is to seek and destroy. <clears throat> when I say seek, you would seek the enemy or destroy the enemy or you had a certain job to do. Again, as I was telling you earlier, the combat engineer, we would clear, clear our LZ landing zone. We might have to use uh, C4, which is an... C4, you're going yeah, to explain that? Yeah, uh, C4 is an explosive that we would use to... It's like dynamite. You would clear out that LZ landing zone so the chopper of the helicopter could get in to take out the, uh, bring in supplies first so that we would have to eat. And the other one, if there's a hot LZ and we have wounded Marines, then we would have to um, get the medevac back. Now you to use the, the term hot LZ. Explain what that. In uh, other words, means. the enemy was shooting, uh, the enemy, we had incoming. Uh, artillery or whatever the uh, explosives was. But you have to have it secured, in other words, before they can even land. They can't land with, if it's raining a lot, but you know, you have your monsoon season, rainy season in Vietnam, and uh, they could not land if the uh, LZ wasn't secure. 
So when enemy is shooting, bringing in uh, the Chinese rockets or whatever they were using, uh, they could not land. Now, you talk about clearing out a uh, LZ for uh, medevac helicopters mm -hmm. to come in or resupply helicopters to come in. What was the uh, what was the terrain like or the foliage or the growth? How, how difficult was that to clear out an area for uh, for helicopters uh, to come in? Sometimes it could be a real heavy terrain. Uh, it could be the bottom of a mountain. It could be on top of a mountain. It depends on where you know what what type of uh, terrain that we're in. It could be in a rice paddy. Uh, you know, rice paddy is where the Vietnamese would grow the rice and they have the water, water buffalo and they would use all kind of ways as, um, uh, for their source of gathering the rice or doing their main source of work. Uh, uh, in those in, in the Vietnam area. So some areas could be very heavy foliage or forest. That would be very difficult, I would, I would think, to clear for helicopters coming in. Yes, and that was our main uh, way we would relieve or uh, support the, uh, our troops uh, by helicopter. And then the other one, the uh, KIA, the ones that was killed in action, again, my responsibility, a part of my task, was to uh, put those troops, soldiers in body bags and mount them and, and secure them so that they can get back to the regular area they need to get. And the other ones, we had hospital ships out in the China Sea that they could take troops that was wounded to that area. Now, you were assigned to a platoon. A platoon is uh, generally around 30 or 40 men, is that correct? Yes. And. Uh, you stayed with that platoon during your tour of duty in Vietnam? Right. Uh, I stayed with that unit uh, uh, for my first tour of Vietnam. As I said, I did. each tour was 13 months. And, of course, two tours would be 26 months. But, yes, I stayed with that first uh, Marine Division. But that platoon, we had a mission that we would go out. Uh, I put 11 operations. That's the Seek and Destroy. And sometimes we were gone for 30 days. Sometimes we were gone for a shorter period of time. Sometimes you do what they call a patrol. You go out that night. <clears throat> you would go through the area. Sometimes we'll leave maybe 0, 600 in the morning when it's dark. And we might have to capture a hill, go up the hill. And you get about 10 minutes. Expect Say we're taking a 20-minute break. You expect 10, you get 5, and you're moving out. Now, with your platoon of those 30 and 40 men, uh, I assume they did suffer some casualties of that platoon. Is that yes, correct? sir. Uh, again, there was some operations, and uh, I had some friends that I had met uh, in boot camp, and uh, one of them was killed. And I told him he was going back to the world. He was in my arms, and he, he passed. Uh, he succumbed to the... Um, uh, wounding of the enemy and it really broke my heart because uh, he passed and I had to put him in a body bag. Now you, you said your your tour was a uh, Marine Corps tour was 13 months is that correct? Yes sir. Mm -hmm. And during those you, you've already described uh, uh, some of your impressions of the uh, of the enemy the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong what were your impressions of the uh, of the South Vietnamese the people who lived there and well uh, I had an opportunity to go to Okinawa to Vietnamese language school and I was blessed to uh, pass that Vietnamese class with um, honors and I was attached to what they call S5 and uh, that was um, we had an interpreter had our Jeep and we would go into the village to uh, on my volunteer time when I was in the rear to work with them with the English and they would work with me at Vietnamese uh, in Vietnamese language, which is a very difficult language. But we were also trained and taught. You couldn't trust a lot of the Southern Vietnamese, as I said before. When I say trust, um, they would make what we call booby traps out of like a right guard can uh, you wouldn't purchase anything from the enemy. Uh, like a right guard can, they would cut the bottom and they would put explosives in, something like a hand grenade, but you wouldn't know it, and they would seal the bottom. You pull that top, 
it would explode. So you couldn't really trust a lot of the Vietnamese. And as I said earlier, in Freedom Hill, uh, they had, it was where a lot of the troops come in for what we call the um, SO shows, the Bob Hope show, uh, James Brown, da 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 But we would have uh, like a barber. You would have where they sell jewelry. You have a PX. Where is, they, that, uh, is that what's called a fire base type situation? Is that a yes, fire base? Right. And you would you would be there when you were not out on field operations. Right, sometime. But what I was getting at, some of the Viet Cong would work in these areas, and at night they would be your enemy. So you had to be very careful and very mindful of uh, purchasing anything from the uh, southern Vietnamese as we travel. Another thing was... Uh, a lot of troops in the rear would want like sodas, pops, or what we call the tiger beer. It was Bamui Bomb, I mean 33, was tiger beer. They would put battery acid and stuff like that. So you, you had to be very mindful of you couldn't trust the, the southern Vietnamese VC. So uh, I gather that uh, you came to the conclusion that a, a lot of the local South Vietnamese were sympathetic to the... Uh, to the Viet Cong and the uh, North. Well, Korea. they were because you know at night we don't know what's going on because in the in the rear area in your NCO club, non commissioned officer, and your uh, officers club, we had uh, in the rear area we had what we call um, the bunks, their, their little where they stayed, and we would call them house mouse, the civilians. So again, we had to check ID. You had to be very, very um, alert on what's going on, who you're employing in these clubs or in these uh, uh, officer quarters or in the NCO quarters. You know, you, 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 you just have to be very careful on who we employ because, again, at night the Viet Cong could roam through that area. Now, when you were out on a mission and you were at a fire base, how – what percentage of the time were you out on a mission, and what percentage of the time did you spend at a fire base, did you describe? Well, as I said, I pulled 11 operations in my first tour, and um, it, it could go from two weeks to a month to two months. The longest I was on operation was probably a month and a half. And that that's was— out, That's out in the field. Yes, sir, in the field. Now, when you're out in the field— what what are your what are your rations? What are you eating out in the field? Well, the Marine Corps uh, was was different. I think there were B ones, B two, which was ham and eggs from the World War Two era. <laughs> they were from World War Two. Yes, and they're still. Okay. Uh, I think they moved up a little bit. Army had C rations. The Army and the Air Force had different, but we had to survive. Uh, we had a water buffalo, a big old round thing that put water uh, to secure your water. You had your canteen. Uh, it was it wasn't a great experience. Uh, Sometimes we would go through the rice paddies. Sometimes the water would be up past the waist. You would get leeches, and we would have to during the day. You could burn them, but at night, remember, you cannot have a fire because the enemy can see that from a far distance. And that's one way to, because I was smoking and I was smoking cool cigarettes back in that day. But and you get a pack of small cigarettes in your C rations. Now, one of the things that uh, people really, uh, really hated uh, were the leeches. Yes. And you've described. Uh, uh, I know that the military, uh, especially the army, uh, had you tape your uh, trousers, your boots, uh, put your Put your uh, long sleeve uh, 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 sleeves down, tape those. Yes. But the leeches always found a way to get in. They found a way to get in. They found a way to make it uncomfortable. And you really didn't have a whole lot of time to deal with the leeches when you're dealing with the enemy. So that was something we had to deal with. But what a painful uh, to have leeches sucking your blood out of you and when the leeches uh, when they did fall off or you burn them off they also had a secretion in it, it, that was kind of acted like an anticoagulate so you kind of kept oozing 
oozing blood for a right. while. Right, but here again we had the corpsman, which is the, the military's best friend. Now, when you were out in the uh, when you're out in the field, you'd already described uh, some of the food. Did you ever get a hot meal? Yes, when I'm back into the rear area, we would get a hot meal. Uh, you can have breakfast, you can have uh, lunch, and sometimes dinner. Once I became an NCO, uh, a corporal, and then a sergeant, it basically you can call your own shots when you're in the rear, and you can get a hot shower and uh, get a good night's sleep. You're not sleeping out in a in a a bunker, and uh, it's very, it's a lot co more comfortable. So the food on the, when you did get the hot food, it sounded like it was pretty good. Yes, sir, it was good. And then on Sundays when we were in the rear, or even when we were out in the field, so to speak, we would have to take a halazone tablet uh, to keep from getting malaria. And uh, that was another problem, but we had to do what we had to do. Now, when you were uh, there, were you there during the uh, 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 the Tet uh, uprising uh, in January of 68. Were you there? Yes. Do you remember, remember that? I, I came in, remember I, I shared it with you, coming from the States, Continental, Continental Airlines, as they were celebrating the Tet offense, which I believe is their New Year, isn't right. it? Right. Yes, it is. And um, it was quite a celebration, and it lasted a long time. And I remember because Otis Redding uh, was one of my uh, popular singers. He was killed in 68 on my way to Vietnam. Uh, and on that route to Vietnam, we stopped in uh, Alaska, and then we stopped in Okinawa to receive all of your shots, and then we went into Vietnam again at, at doing Tet. It was, I hadn't even received my weapon. But when the Tet offensive or uprising occurred, uh, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, Many of the uh, civilians that were in South Vietnam rose up and uh, uh, really fought on the side of the North Vietnamese at that time. Yes, they joined the ranks with them. And uh, again, it was a celebration, but we had to be very mindful to only communicate with, and we had civilian uh, interpreters, we had rock marines, we had Australian Rock marines military. being the Republic of, uh, of Vietnam, I mean, Republic of uh, Korea. Korea. Korea, yes, Korea. Okay. Uh, and we had those units with us as well. So we were well um, uh, together, so to speak. Uh, we were well equipped uh, with the air and the land and the sea as well. Uh, you know, with the Navy, um, the Air Force, because most of your uh, support would come in from those units uh, when we were out in the, we call it the bush, some people call it the field, um, on operation. Okay. And, uh, but uh, uh, it, it was, it, it, it was an event, it was a war that I have no regrets. Uh, if I had to do it again, I'd join the Marine Corps. Well, tell us about uh, the weapons uh, that uh, you or as a Marine had while you were in Vietnam. Tell us about your basic uh, weapons. Well, uh, the basic weapon for the Marines were the M16, and, you, and I'm glad you call it a weapon because a lot of people say this is um, a gun. This is not, this is, this is a, a, a weapon, it's not a gun, it's used for killing and not for fun. So uh, you had to take care of your weapon so your weapon would take care of you. What do you mean? I'm glad you asked. When we we're on combat, uh, as again, rice paddies and the mud, monsoon season, the rain, we have to make sure you keep that, uh, all your magazines dry, do the best you can. But if you get it jammed uh, and it doesn't work, then we got a problem. Now the M16s, uh, there were a lot of complaints about it. They jammed pretty easy. Right. Is that your experience? I, I have no confirmation on mind jamming, and I have no confirmation on a KIA, kill in action. I can't confirm that I really, but it never jammed. Thank God it didn't. It didn't. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that that's fairly unusual. Yes. Uh, if, and some of these uh, conversations I've had with people. Mm -hmm. So that was your basic, uh, the Marine Corps' basic weapon, the M16. Yes, sir. Now, did you have uh, did you have a sidearm, a, a, a pistol? or? No, sir. Uh, some of them had the 45, and they would carry that. 
But with me, and again with the support, I believe it's called the PR25, it's a radio with the whip on yeah. top, and you would have to bring the whip down to keep it from being seen through the boonies, as we would call it, or through the <clears throat> terrain. Um, but that was mostly what I had to communicate, and thanks God for the Morris court, you know, I could call in uh, the coordinates where we were by using Morris code, like my name is Coates, Charlie, Oscar, Alpha, Tango, Echo, Sierra, means Coates. Okay. Uh, if we're in an area, I can use that code, and suppose they're not supposed to know that. That's one of the top um, things that I, I use. Um, thank God for uh, having that uh, PR-25. Now they have advanced a lot more. Now, one of, the, uh, one of the things the Marines carried was uh, usually a, a personal knife. I think, was that correct? Yes. Um, referred to as the K-Bar? Yeah, uh, yes, they would car carry that in case for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Or you can adapt it on the front of your weapon. That never happened to me. I wasn't, we were never overrun in the unit that I was in, but it's there. And one of the best things the Marine Corps taught us in combat you would yell, you know, and that's scare anybody. If I yell now, but Frank Ben, you have been. I probably uh, jump out yeah. here. But uh, but the, we would have it for many other things as well. As you're going through the um, terrain, sometimes you can cut some of the terrain down with that. And we had the large uh, Kang knives, as they call it, to do that. But it can be used for a weapon as well. Once you overrun. Uh, you run out, out of uh, uh, your weaponry, so to speak. You got to use what you got to use. Now, uh, the North. Tell us about what was your impression. You mentioned the AK-47. Mm -hmm. The AK-47 was the basic rifle of the North Vietnamese. What, what was your What was your opinion or your impression of the AK-47? I was. Uh, to me, uh, it was. I've seen a few of them, uh, and we were not allowed to send them back to the states. Now you can buy them through um, uh, the media, social uh, media. But uh, the AK-47, I thought, was a pretty good weapon uh, for use for combat. A lot of uh, uh, soldiers purchased them. A lot of soldiers, you know, not let's use the word secured them. But we had to leave them overseas. You could not bring them back. If I remember, one of the things that uh, was the uh, uh, AK-47, it rarely ever jammed. Right. That's I why mean, I say in, that in the mud and the yeah. dirt and the, right. all that stuff. That was yeah. one of the uh, that was one of the attributes that the AK-47 yeah. uh, uh, had during that time. Uh, you've mentioned uh, that the uh, Viet Cong and North Vietnamese were very good at taking things and uh, adapting them and making weapons out of them with uh, various booby traps yes. and things. So I, one of the things that I've been told uh, by other veterans in Vietnam is that you didn't leave anything behind because no. uh, the Viet Cong could use that. Right. Is that correct? You would not leave anything behind, nor would you leave uh, uh, one of our... Um, soldiers or one of our troops behind. And we were talking booby traps. Um, I'm from New Smyrna, as I said, and there was another young man from New Smyrna. I don't know if I'm allowed to use his name. Uh, Probably not. No, okay. But he was a uh, tunnel rat. And one of the other uh, traps that the Vietnamese would use, they would have um, the snakes in a tunnel hanging down and as snakes. you enter yeah snakes and as you enter that tunnel they could bite you that was one another one they would have and we were trained on landmines and traps in other words you can have a terrain and it's like covered and you don't know where the landmines are you have to be very careful and they have a little uh gadget as we might say uh component to find uh where those landmines are a lot of uh, landmines on operations, they would explode, and of course that would do damage to the enemy as well. So we had to be we had to be very mindful again of where we were, the terrain, uh, the rice paddies, uh, wherever you are, because the enemy had a lot of ways to uh, slow us down or actually harm our, our troops. Now you've mentioned. Uh, uh before that, that you had some friends that were hurt, did you mm -hmm. 
did you lose several friends or to wound it? Or? I, lo- I lost, as I said, I, I can't call the name, but um, um, I lost one or two good friends. And the, world, the word was, you're going to be okay, baby. You're going back to the world. And the world, of course, was a great, great old USA. But uh, there was a lot of our troops that was killed, and um, which you know, and a lot of my friends were wounded very badly. Uh, and the one, uh, I did mention his name, uh, NBC, Jonas Nair, uh, he was wounded, and he has the mentality probably of a two-year-old. And we got together before Brandon passed, and we went to the uh, Jacksonville Zoo, and he would say, Coach, Coach, uh, a giraffe, giraffe. Uh, it, was, it was very sad. And my birthday is the 4th of July, and Brandon and Jonas came down, and the fireworks went off, and we had to run and get him because he was wounded and, uh, up in Fubai, that's North Vietnam, and the helicopter crashed, and he was uh, one of the only one survivors. So it, it's, it's sad. But it's true. Now, you finished up your first tour, 13 months, came back to the... Where did they send you when you came back? I went to Key West, Florida, the little White House. Well, that sounded like pretty Key nice West. duty then. I, I didn't like it. Um, I signed the waiver. I was there about a month. You were there as cart. They they had the Marines that did guard duty around the little we White House guard, of the president. Yeah, we was uh, guards. Uh, we uh, guard the little White House. And uh, it just wasn't for me. Most of, uh, uh, 90% of my time was spent in combat. And my MOS wasn't crucial in this area. It wasn't that I was hard to train for that. I just felt I was needed back in Vietnam. So you, you did it, you volunteered and did a second tour. Is that yeah, correct? And the se- second tour. How yeah, long, the same how long between the end of your first tour and the beginning of your second tour? About two months. That's it? Yes. And then was that the second tour another 13 months? Another 13 months. And uh, again, I, my MOS wasn't a crucial uh, to be employed here in the States. And I just made sure that I would, um, I could be finishing my task in Vietnam. Now, so. did they, do uh, you know, when you went, did they send you back to the same area? The same yes, time? sir. I was blessed to get the same unit. But I was working uh, in what we call S5 in an office. I had an interpreter. I would hire the, um, we call them house mouses, uh, the uh, employees for the base. Uh, That was one. Uh, And that's when I got an opportunity to use my Vietnamese language, which I still can use some today, but um, it helped me out. And we helped a lot of the civilians that had you know, the small uh, band-aid requests or uh, in the villages they had no, uh, I felt like a habitat person to help them build, the civilians help them build and uh, make a better relationship with our military and uh, the civilians. So was your second tour 69 and 70? Was that the year? 70 was my last tour. That's when I came home. Okay. And um, that's when... Uh, Again, with my military and Vietnam experience, uh, I was unemployable. Um, So uh, that's when I took advantage of uh, the GI Bill and was allowed to retrain into a different Now, when you you went over for your second tour, did you notice any difference in the attitude of your fellow Marines to the war? Well, they had, when I say they, there was issues going on in the first and the second uh, with military. That we had our racial issues. We had um, issues where separation, uh, identity. Uh, it was there was some differences among our own comrades. Well, how about? Do you notice any difference in the South Vietnamese citizens? Uh, about the attitude of the war or toward, the, toward well, you as a Marine? Well, they had their differences again. Some loved it, the Marines, especially the little baby, the military that was there, especially the young ones. 
uh, they, you know, they would wave. But again, you had to be very careful. You know, even they would have explosives. They would uh, have little booby traps. And, but uh, most of the uh, Southern Vietnamese had a great um, rapport with our military. Now, when you came back from uh, your second tour, this was uh, this was when the United States uh, was starting to have a lot of uh, resistance to the war, a lot of protests to the war. How were you treated when you came back uh, for the second uh, time? You were still well, in uniform. When yes, you came. I was still a, a, a Marine feeling, but they, we had a lot of protests. We were called baby killers. We were called a lot of things that wasn't, I would say, accepted uh, by our fellow Americans. But uh, again, I overlooked that and moved forward. That's pretty magnanimous uh, because uh, I think some of the troops were treated pretty badly when it's, they when they returned. Yes, and the, and there were there was issues as I say they would call us baby killers, they would call us uh, all kind of names. But again, we had a job to do, and I'm very proud to be a Marine to do the job that I was sent to do. Mr. Coates, I ask uh, I ask all Vietnam veterans this question. Looking back on the Vietnam War with a 50-year perspective now, looking mm -hmm. back on it, what do you think that? Uh, what do you think about the war and how the United States handled the war, and if anything should have been done different? What was your What's your opinion looking back on the war now, 50 years later? Well, if I can use a biblical term, a biblical scripture, there always would be wars and rumors of wars. But as I look back over my life, I look back over the war in Vietnam and I read about the war that my father served in, World War II. Uh, this was a war that I don't think we really won. It was a war that needed us over as military support and it kind of expanded to a whole lot of young people dying at a young age. Well, I, I, I and I, I'm sure the audience appreciates uh, appreciates your expressions of uh, the war. And as we end this interview, uh, Mr. Coates, I want to I want to thank you again for your service uh, as a Marine and to this country and uh, to this area, the Newsom Reach area. After the, after the war, you've stayed around now. You've uh, you've been involved uh, in. Uh, uh, the local uh, uh, doings around here for a long time. You also have been inducted into the uh, New Smyrna High School Hall of Fame uh, for your background. So, so thank you very much for all that, and uh, thanks for coming today and, and being a part of this interview. It was on, Mr. Frank Farmer, <laughs> uh, and if I had to do it again, I would. And thank you again for the invitation, and uh, I thank all of you for allowing me to be a part of this reconnect of the Vietnam conflict. Thank you. Thank you.